Hi, my name is Adam Howell. I am the founder of Phys Ed Edagogy, and welcome to the Phys Ed Summit 3.0. Are you ready to get your learn on? Thank you so much for joining us. It is a 24 hour back to back to back to back global event. But we cannot make this day happen without you. We are very humbled by the outpouring of support and promotion of the summit from every one of you. By sharing with one person, you are able to impact many others, including students. Thank you so much for being here to push best practices, effective physical education, and professional development forward. This is an amazing PE community, and we are so excited to be a part of it. Reminder, we are using technology. Technology is never perfect. Our first session is a pre-recorded session, so our back channel chat will be taking place in the Tazel where resources will be available, and a time marker will be posted by me, the moderator, uh, to help you with where we are with our chat. After the summit, we will post the feedback survey on the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 homepage. We hope that you will provide us with some feedback. It's going to be really helpful for us as we continue to look at our evidence of impact and how successful the Phys Ed Summit is in changing and pushing best practices forward. I would like to introduce our very first presenter, Mary Neal. Mary Neal is a health and physical educator at the elementary level in the Peel District School Board in Ontario, Canada. She has presented at PDSB Think, Act, Be, Fit conference on student-led assessment in PHE, an avid user of her online PLN for ongoing learning since 2013, Mary has learned how to use technology to help in all aspects of teaching, physical education, and health, including student self-regulation. She is also on her school's Climate and Mental Health Committee and uses TRIBE's program to help build a learning community at her school. And without further ado, I introduce to you Mary Neal in our first session at Phys Ed Summit 3.0. Okay, welcome. I'm going to set up our slideshow to get started. Hi, my name is Mary Neal and I am a teacher in the Peel District School Board. I teach grade kindergarten to grade five physical education. You can reach me at Mrs. Neal Zero on Twitter or by email mary.neal at plsb.com. Today's session is called Help Self-Regulation in PE. We're going to be using Twitter today and Tazel to answer questions um, uh, on the back channel. So uh, if using Twitter, you use hash um, hashtag selfregpe or hashtag um, phys ed summit 3.0 or phys ed summit, that's fine. Um, my name again on Twitter is at Mrs. Neil Zero. So go ahead and answer the three questions I have on this page. What country are you from? What field are you in? And what age or grades do you teach? And I'll just talk while you're doing that. So many great ideas for student learning in PE are available to teachers, but how can we ensure our classrooms and communities foster safe, welcoming learning environments? What can we do to restore trust and reassure students will be safe in our classrooms? Great learning comes only after students feel safe. Participants will share ideas around, the class, around classroom routines and climate and behavior management strategies. Now, I'm going to just tell you what we're going to talk about in this session, so you're understanding what you'll be learning. Um, I will be focusing on a couple of resources I used this summer. The first one is Calm, Alert, and Learning by Stuart Shanker, and his uh, information is there, Stuart, at Stuart Shanker on Twitter. And the second is the Pre-Referral Intervention Manual, PRIM, which probably is available with your principal. 
both are available online. Um, and if we have time, I'm going to be talking about uh, self-regulation apps. So first we'll talk about what is self-regulation and the viewpoints between misbehavior and stress behavior. We'll investigate tools to create positive climate and help students to calm down or to become alert for learning. And we'll explore cultural diversity. We're going to apply the knowledge that we learn in the workshop right away. And we'll be doing that on Twitter with some feedback. And we will review possible answers for our questions from the PRIM manual. And as I said, we're going to touch on technology. So in the spirit of regulating ourselves and calming down, I'm going to go through an exercise with you. You can see uh, a screen that gives you some uh, quick, uh, calm breathing uh, techniques. And that is from an app called Mind Shift. I'm not actually going to play it for you right now, but I am going to play my Tibetan singing bowl at the side. And by playing that, if you intentionally listen to that sound and try to filter out anything else, you'll kind of feel what calm is. So think about just listening to the sound and beginning some deep, slow breaths through your nose, holding it and then releasing it. That's a way to bring focus back to your classroom or to calm people down. The other thing in that picture is called the Ting Sha, and uh, Neela Steele introduced me to those. So I enjoyed going shopping for some new things to be mindful. Okay, here's our next Twitter question. It's on your viewpoint. When a child misbehaves, how does your viewpoint on the same event differ from these people? Parents, other teachers, students, cultural groups. Please answer on Twitter or Tazo at Mrs. Neil Zero, hashtag self PE, hashtag Viz Ed Summit. Ten seconds more. Stuart Shanker taught it was talking in a webinar on um, I'll just hide my little thing at the bottom. Um, Stuart Shanker was talking on a webinar, the Thompson Huddle Connects down here at the bottom. That's the link. And he spoke about self-regulation in physical education. And what I took from that was that there's, you have to realize there's a difference uh, between viewpoints on misbehavior and stress behavior. Those believe that a behavior that presents as a misbehavior will give the child a consequence. The child will lose some privileges. But in that same tone, that child is still angry and upset and is not calmed down. Uh, so the student doesn't learn to self-regulate. I think I will speak later on how Dr. Shanker was explaining in that video that your frontal cortex is the self-control area of your brain. And when it gets into the fight or flight mode, it will shut down. Hence, we get children with no self-control. 
Now, if we look at the same behavior as a stress behavior, uh, you can see the child and you ask yourself, is the child hyper aroused or hypo aroused? And then you have to ask, why might this behavior be presenting? Then you want to prompt the student to use calming strategies or find ways to take the trigger away. Now, Dr. Shanker mentions five domains in his book, Calm, Alert, and Learning, uh, that affect self-regulation, biological, emotional, cognitive, social, and pro-social. And he says that all must be considered when helping a child self-regulate because they kind of affect each other. So if a child is having a, uh, not a good, not making good choices in terms of making friends and things like that, it could be backed up to emotional or even biological. He describes optimal self-regulation as the state of calm focus and alertness appropriate for learning. The six critical elements to be in self, optimal self-regulation are the following. When feeling calmly focused and alert, it's the ability to know one is calm and alert. When one is stressed, it's the ability to recognize what's causing the stress. It's also the ability to recognize stressors both within and outside the classroom. And it's the desire to deal with those stressors. It's the ability to develop strategies for dealing with the stressors and the ability to recover efficiently and effectively from dealing with stressors. Now, I mentioned before about um, consequences, giving consequences to students. So most students can take a consequence because they have the ability to recover efficiently and effectively from dealing with a stressor and they're able to cope and they're able to self-regulate. But for a child who has not, the, has not got that ability to get out of an arousal cycle, those types of consequences don't work. So I just want to make it clear that it's okay as well to use all uh, variants of ways to deal and consequences to deal with behavior. But there are some children that will really need help if they don't know how to self-regulate yet. So how do we self-regulate? We call it down, or Dr. Shanker calls it down-regulating uh, to bring yourself down to an alert, calm space for learning, or up-regulating, which is bringing a child that might be anxious or uh, into the flight mode, uh, ready and alert for learning. Okay, the point of it is to get out of that arousal cycle, as I spoke earlier, the frontal cortex shuts down, and regu which regulates our self-control, meaning we're out of control. We need to work on breathing technique. We need to ask the teacher to remove the trigger if possible. If it's noise, if it's uh, too many balls going on at the same time. We need to give the child choices for how to calm down, or how to get out of that situation. If we give them an ultimatum, it usually it increases their, um, their stress arousal. You can ask the child to tell them, ask how they feel. I feel angry. I'm going to be angry or they get aware of what they're feeling, which is really important. So it's a good uh, thing to do is to acknowledge their feelings and have them think positive self-talk work use statements like, this is hard, but I can do it. I can change today's outcome. So if we need to upregulate, we need to give a child warning of upcoming changes. We need to provide interesting choices, and we need to get that child moving throughout the day. Uh, DPA, obstacle course, cycling, could even be an obstacle course in their classroom where they're just, you know, doing something different in their classroom too get them moving and it's important to set an intention like a goal today I am going to try to move in the gym class or whatever the goal is 
Yes, I've been talking to many people on Voxer and on Twitter, and I've talked to my principal, my BTA, a special education resource teacher. Um, I have gotten a lot of uh, ideas and I'm just kind of generalize them here. How to decrease behaviors. First, greet students with at, at your gym. Give yourself time to have relational time. Get, say hello. Greet each person. How are you doing? Keep them moving. Instant activities, chalkboard, chalkboard personal challenges. So uh, Stephen Colleen gave me the chalkboard personal challenge. Uh, so he has kids come in, read the whiteboard, and then they go off and try the exercise, which is related to whatever he's teaching that day. And Amanda Stanek, if you've ever been to her workshop, her, she will give the cognitive information out while you're doing a plank or while you're doing some kind of a exercise or a balance. So uh, it's really interesting. And if you go on Voxer or Twitter, you can learn a lot about instant activities, instant games that kids can do when they come in. Uh, there's lots of resources out there. You can co-create rules with your student and they can be taught through games. You can involve the behavioral student in setup or cleanup and give them a job to hold the equipment so their hands are busy. Uh, teaching personal social responsibility is from Don Hallison. I've been introduced to him through Joey Thief at the PE Institute. And a lesson in, in his type of lesson would start with a relational time at the beginning an awareness talk about what social skill we're working on or what value. And then we work on that skill in our physical activity of the day. And then you reflect on it. Be clear in your why, what, how of lesson, because if a child does not understand what they are doing or why they are doing it, they may lead, this may lead to uh, being off task and give them an autonomy. It's ideal if students can choose an activity so they feel like they have some ownership and they have some choice as to what they can do. Provide a quiet cool off area in your gym for anyone, but have it there so that they can do, uh, they can do their self-regulation and, and then rejoin when they're ready. At our school, we do Kelso's Choices. It's a great visual tool for um, English language learners and elementary students. It gives students choices for solutions uh, so that they have a lot of choice to figure out how to solve a problem. And it's used throughout our school at recess. It's a common language. And I took the picture from Osama at Osama13 on Twitter. <clears throat> and it's just uh, easy to read. It's friendly and uh, they are great suggestions. SNAP came from um, the Calm Alert and Learning book by Dr. Shanker. It's uh, from the Canadian Safe Schools Network and it's another uh, problem solving, calming down process. So stop now and plan. Stop means things I can do to stop myself from making my problem bigger such as snap my fingers, take deep breaths, put hands in pockets, take a step back, count to 10. Now and is the things I say to myself to calm down. For example, calming thoughts and coping statements. This is hard, but I can do it. I can stay in control. I can change today's outcome. And planning. Planning is making a plan so that what what I can do to make this problem smaller, not hurt myself or others, and make me feel like a winner. I'm sure you have other systems, and maybe you can share that on Twitter, how you get children to calm down. Mel Hamada, uh, you can see her Twitter handle there, MJ Hamada. Uh, she was talking to me about visual, visible thinking routines, and um, she Here's a way we can get peer assessment and self-assessment in the living skills um, component of our education program. 
you can have peers assess their group and how they're working together, building an awareness of how they apply their social skills. You can put yourself in others' shoes, do an activity where you switch roles and you can build empathy. Uh, kids can journal about their activities and I'm sure my friends on Twitter have different ways that we could record that uh, self-reflection. Please share that on Twitter on the back channel. Now I'm going to talk about safety rules for teaching environments, student, classmates, and the teacher. And thanks to Mike Graham for this great rule of the gym. It's brilliant and well laid out. So indoors, you want to build a caring environment, trusting positive climate. You want to co-create the rules with for those non-negotiables of safety ideas, and you want to introduce whatever problem-solving model you're going to use for your classroom when things do not, when conflicts occur. These uh, resources were given to me by uh, the HPE blog, that's Stephen Colleen. He's also a teacher in Peel. I use tribes in my Classroom, these are our four rules, mutual respect, appreciation, no put downs, right to pass or participate, and attentive listening. I got this set of posters from Tanya's Treats for Teachers. Go to that site at the bottom and you can download these uh, PDFs for free for your classroom. And Tribes is a way of uh, learning to work together. So it's it's a whole process. It's kind of neat looking to that. That's Jeannie Gibbs, the tribes. Okay, when we go outdoors, we have the same rules as indoor that we review, the respect, the boundaries. We have a little bit of a, a more bigger space. So there's more potential for things to, to escalate. So make sure you talk to your student about how they feel, acknowledge their feelings, and make sure they understand how to solve a problem, whatever problem solving model you have. Assign other students as a buddy to that student. So in case they just can't handle it and they start running away, there might be somebody with them. And also have a phone available to you so that you can call the office or admin if you need them. So uh, the student who needs a safety plan, he needs a place or she needs a place to downregulate. The student needs to try their stop now and plan or whatever uh, common strategies they have. It's important that all teachers communicate with each other. So any teacher that sees the student and, excuse me, the behavioral teaching assistants, the special ed teachers that we all communicate. And really key is to communicate with the parents. How can we help this child be successful? And what triggers might the child have? And what has, if anything, has worked in to calm the child? And incidents do happen, so we need to consider the safety of the classmates. So first, when they happen, ensure the safety of the students, and then rebuild the trust. You rebuild trust by having the students practice the I feel statements, I feel scared when I get pushed over, etc. I use a stop and rethink form um, where uh, the child who displays a behavior has time to think about the behavior, well, how it affected our, our agreements of the gym, and um, how it made others feel, and how, um, how it can be changed in the future. And community circles are a, a part of tribes where you have everybody sitting in a circle facing each other so everyone can see one person speaking at a time and you get to, you get to share your concerns and, and share possible solutions to problems in a respectful way. Teachers, you should also have a teacher buddy somewhere that's close to the gym or close to your outside space where it could be a holding room for the student who needs to down regulate or for the class if the student is having a, a moment of being out of control and is 
creating a safety hazard for students. So set that up at the beginning of the year so that you know it's there. You may never need it, but it's good to have just in case. So safety tips for the teacher are to build relationships with your students. Greetings, hallways, you can catch them doing something good. Uh, model self-regulation for your students. Remain on an even keel, even when a child is out of control in the class. Try not to rise to that, try not to get angry with that, and remain even and respectful and speak with the facts. That will help them calm down. Social media, just be professional on social media because anybody can see it. Uh, keep your hands off students. Nearby phones, make sure there are nearby phones or you carry a phone with you and tell the office where you're going. If you're taking them out to a tennis court or off to the field, let them know where you're going to be. And document everything. Even though it seems minor, you can. Uh, you might want to want write it down and you then also have a record of uh, behaviors and what happened before the event is a good idea. ABC antecedent is what happens before the event, the behavior itself and any consequences we put in place um, and how they, how that all turned out. What was the outcome from that? Did it, was it a positive situation or did the consequence not happen? So English language learners and cultural diversity, uh, it's helpful when you're setting up rules to make them visual and do a look like, sounds like, feels like, write it out with the kids so they understand it and just have a few rules so that they're not bombarded by, by many rules. As I mentioned before, I use a Google form, but my students can use the voice to text option by pressing the microphone and so they get uh, to speak out what they need to share about their behavior. You can buddy the student with a person who can speak in the home language and they can speak in the home language during class and find out a strategy to win the game or whatever or if they need to explain um, you know what this next exercise is going to be they can do that in their home language and it moves quite quicker and it makes that child feel safe and comfortable. Model proper behavior. So what you want them to see, you should model it. Uh, it's called interactive modeling. I've, I've been introduced to that from Rachel Adsert on uh, Twitter and the website is below. So to learn how to do the seven steps of interactive modeling would be good. Modeling would be good with any student, but especially with uh, um, English language learners. So you can have your student discuss at home and compare the rules at home, at their place of worship, and in the community so that they get a sense of what the rules are and they can talk to you about what the rules are in their places of, of worship at, at, in their lives. And you should find out more about about and be sensitive to the various cultural practices in your community. One way you could do that is to host a family fitness night, open house, and build community relationships or inform people about your co-created expectations or your physical education program. And you can help build that relationship between our parents and our program school. There are two people here I would recommend getting in touch with about Family Fitness Night. Aviva Rosenberg is a Peel teacher. You can reach her at, at, at FIA on Twitter. And Ted, his life, at, life is athletic. Communication is key. So keep the positive uh, conversation going with parents. Um, work with them as a team to pro solve problems or problem solve. Uh, again, talking to your classroom teacher or your designated early childhood educator, and it's an ongoing conversation, fluid all the time. 
Special education teachers, behavioral teaching assistants have great ideas. Principals should know about anything that you're probably going to be talking about with parents. They might want to know. The student themselves, and here's the key. We can't be talking about the student. We need to talk with the student to make sure that they're going to learn anything from self-regulation. So re remember to include the student in on these conversations in, in on the problem solving. Uh, classmates, continue talking with them in a community circle. It's a great way to feel the pulse of your class. Okay, now we're going to do some work on it. We've learned a lot of techniques. We're going to use the PRIM manual to help us answer the questions, but uh, I'm going to put the questions out to you first and see what you come up with on Twitter. So get ready to go on Twitter. The first question, you can answer at A1 <clears throat> on Twitter at Mrs. Neil Zero, um, is to pick one of these behaviors and answer why it why this behavior might be presenting and what educators can do to lessen their triggers or help students calm down. So pick one of these three to talk about. So A1A would be gets back at other students who have wronged the student. A1B would be cannot resolve the conflicts. And C would be interrupts the teacher and other students. So take a minute now and try that. Tell me why this behavior would happen and how we can reduce the triggers or calm the student down. Okay, let's see the answers. When a child gets back at others, when he feels someone has wronged him, you can work on the developing their coping techniques, walk away, deep breathing. You can use role play to explore the situation and discuss alternative solutions. They may not be able to advocate for themselves. So again, teaching that personal um, problem solving skills, be calm and neutral and acknowledge the student's feelings. And they may associate bad feelings with being bad. Remind the student that him or her, herself is good, but the choices we make sometimes can be poor or good. The person does not demonstrate the ability to resolve conflicts. So maintain mobility in your classroom. Don't force the student to interact with people they're uncomfortable with. Treat the student with respect, again, talking in an objective manner at all times. Give them a variety of ways to solve conflict, withdrawing, reasoning, calling in an arbitrator, apologizing, compromising, allowing others the benefit of the doubt. This is where Kelso's choices comes in nicely. Explain that it's natural for, con for conflict situations to occur, but it's more important about how they react to a situation. And explore appropriate solutions would could be used to solve such a problem. I'm just going to let you know that there are many other um, points in the prim that could give, give you an answer. These are just the ones that I pulled out, which is kind of neat. You could pull out the ones that will work, you think, for you. And if it doesn't work, you can go back, figure it out. So if a student interrupts a teacher or other students, keep the student engaged in activities that they like so they won't interrupt. Give clear, concise, brief um, instructions. Acknowledge the student's presence and his need to talk. So just, just a minute, smile and nod. Um, I'm going to go down to the periodic student self-check-in. Just double check how you're doing. And having another student or yourself give him a cue when the student is interrupting, like a hand touch or something that he predetermines is his cue, like, oh, I'm interrupting, so that he gets 
build an awareness about the interruptions. Uh, encourage that student then to wait when he feels the urge to interrupt. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of this rule, talk to three before you talk to me. It's a good rule to you know, scaffold them into calm to uh, waiting. So our second work on it question is regarding motivation. Similar idea where you're going to answer the why did the behavior might have happened and what we can do to reduce it. Here are the question to um, behaviors that you're going to think about. A child physically runs away from problems or class. A child blames others for equipment or mistakes. Uh, for equip blames others or equipment for their mistakes. And C, the child ignores consequences of their behavior. So answer on Twitter or Tazo at Mrs. Neal Zero, hashtag self right PE. And we'll give you another minute and a half. Let's check out the answers. In motivation, if a child physically runs away, reduce stimuli that might, you know, visuals in your classroom or noise or lots of balls that may contribute to the running away. Provide a quiet space that is an alternative to running away. Find out what their favorite activities are. Modify the task to prevent frustration and anger. So maybe the task is too hard. Intervene early. Um, to prevent the upset that would cause a student to run away. And talk to the student when they're not stressed about a plan to cope with that type of stress in PE, the unpleasant experiences. So things like talk to the teacher, go to a quiet space, walk the boundary lines, thumbs up, thumbs down. Be supportive, talk in a respectful, objective manner. Teach the student acceptable ways to communicate displeasure, anger, and frustration, and allow the student to voice his or her opinion. Okay, so this student <clears throat> blames other people or materials for to avoid taking responsibility for mistakes. Try to reduce the, uh, the stress of being in a competition. So instead of competition, work on cooperation, cooperative care. Um, give assistance if he indicates a need for help. Give tasks, again, that are initially going to be successful for them and gradually increase the level of difficulty. And make sure your instructions are clearly stated and you can have the student repeat the instructions. Help the student feel comfortable coming to you for assistance by listening and helping. So if a student starts blaming, Calmly present the student with the facts and encourage them an open and honest line of communication. And um, avoid arguing with the student. Just simply explain that he's not being completely honest about a situation, but only if you have proof on that. So just being honest and calm. So a child who ignores the consequences of the behavior. Well, Structure your environment to limit that. Keep them engaged in student activities. Give them student voice over the activity. Give them a helper job. Remind students to stop and think as, sh as they begin to act without thinking first. So uh, some kind of calming process like snap. Help the student realize all behavior has negative and positive consequences. Provide choice to the student, allowing him to practice choosing positive behaviors. Uh, discuss consequences before the activity. 
give positive reinforcement and we're seeing positive behavior. Each time a consequence is delivered, have the student explain why she thinks that happened and maintain a routine that will minimize the erratic or impulsive behavior. Okay, question three, work on it. Pick one of these behaviors, tell me why it might be presenting and how we can reduce the trigger. Uh, demonstrate inappropriate behavior in a large group or doesn't demonstrate appropriate behavior in group games. You have a minute and a half on Twitter. Or Tazel. And the answers from the prim manual. For a student who demonstrates inappropriate behavior in a large group, give the student responsibilities in the group. Give them the choice of activity, make sure they understand directions for the activity, play inclusive games for introductions so student can get to know who they're working with, ensure ample personal space for the activity, and plan an alternate activity if the student cannot handle the group activity. Allow student to have breaks, praise the positive, and frame your feedback so it's not threatening, for example. A better way you can do that, or how else can you do this? How can you show me a different way to? This student doesn't demonstrate appropriate behavior in group games. Have a peer model the game, have the student question directions and, and anything he doesn't understand. Have the student practice the appropriate interactions with the teacher in the games. Assign students with desirable social skills with the student in the games. Try cooperative versus competitive. Teach the problem solving skills and calming techniques so they can better deal with problems and interactions during games. Establish a set of behavior rules for group games and practice. Like in the lead up game, follow those rules. For example, following rules, take turns, making positive statements, work as a team member. Follow team names. We encourage a student to use SNAP, Kelsey's Choices, or other um, uh, processes to help them self regulate in the game and allow the student to voice their opinion. Last question on rules. Work on it. Pick the behavior and answer why it might be happening and what. Educators can do to lessen the trigger. Answer on Tazo or Twitter. Here are the behaviors. Doesn't use equipment properly. Doesn't follow directives from teachers and adults. Acts impulsively. No self control. Here are the answers. When they don't use equipment properly, choose a peer to model proper use of equipment. Have student repeat instructions of proper use of equipment. Establish a routine to organize and use the equipment. And reinforce that those that use the equipment properly and have the student help with the setup and the cleanup. 
does not follow directives from teachers and other school personnel. Give the student a responsibility at the beginning of each directive. Have them verbally uh, repeat the directive. Give positive feedback as they follow directions. Maintain professional relationship, not adversarial. That would be helpful for us if we keep it uh, professional. Be consistent. Provide options to make, cho make the student choose. Um, intervene early to prevent the contagion effect with other students. Chunk your instruction step by step. Interact stu with student frequently to check compliance. In, uh, be consistent throughout the school with the enforcement of rules. And add incentive statements. You may have free time when you finish cleaning up the basketballs. And if they are acting impossibly without a parent self-control, Assist the student, have a visual checklist of what to do, have them verbalize their progress, have a predetermined signal that you can give the student when they start becoming impulsive so that they can be aware of it and try their calming strategies. Assign a spot in the gym if they are sitting for any time, um, like a poly spot or one of these um, balance spots. Meaning, <clears throat> maintain a consistent routine, make sure students know their off-limit areas, be honest and supportive with your feedback, and have them do their self-regulation in the quiet spot before they come back. Okay. So now, quickly on technology, because I know that uh, Adam needs to move on to his next, next thing. I'm going to see uh, what we can do there. Um, I'm going to talk about QR codes right now. You can use them to link to calming videos, Google Forms. You can link to a timed activity, return after the activity is finished so that they are, you know, there's a time limit to the time that you're going to be in the cool out station. You know? um, start with a series of pictures showing how you're feeling, and then it has strategies behind it to show you how to cool your, come down. To cool down. I invite you to go to Ma Matthew Bassett's um, Twitter handle and he will have some great expectations he shared on Boxer and he could probably share them on Twitter uh, at phys.edapps. Uh, it's very neat. You should check that out. Online Cosmic Kids Yoga is a great place to do a little yoga with your primary students and meditation. And these are some um, apps that can distract kids, calm kids, and uh, and help them out. Okay, so I am going to see if we can quickly see if I can get on. If not, then it's okay. We'll talk about it later. It doesn't look like it's going to work. Oh, never mind. I'm going to not use the technology today as it doesn't work. Oh, there it is. Maybe I can. Okay, there's the ear server. Woohoo! So, the regulation apps are here. MindShift is the one that has many different things for people with anxiety. Um, it has so many things you can pick from to help a child become more aware and how to handle themselves. The smash gym where you get a kid who needs to throw equipment, no, I don't want to throw the equipment, I want you to smash the TVs. Just something to, you know, quickly get them out of that. Um, if you want to cute and cool, it, you can set up a timer. This is what we're going to do and then do the timer. You can have a task so they can anticipate what's going on. And uh, first you need to put your shoes on, then you get to play. So that's kind of cool. Um, my software form is on Google. You can make it easily. And uh, my students will fill it in.
they wrong, what um, agreements they didn't do, and then they you can uh, get a child to be aware and self-aware and back into it and you can use this outside um, outside uh, if you have Wi-Fi on your phone or whatever and just have them do that right there in the middle of the field so you don't have to sit down and get a piece of paper to do that <coughs> teeny tiny ohm you might want to check it out for a quiet corner and uh, kids create their own activities. Um, so that's so then they, they have a set of yoga poses that they're going to do. Just kind of neat. And it can make kids self-aware of their body. I have run out of time. I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Thank Phys Ed Summit team for uh, bringing me here. I am going to uh, show you my sources while I say my thank yous. Okay, and uh, I can be available right now for another 15 minutes to answer any questions while I'm on Twitter or Tossle. So again, thanks very much. and. Sharing is caring. Have a great day.